Oh, uh, hello. Uh, ah! Metroid 2, or as I call it, the one before Super. I didn't have that great of an opinion on this one for a while. Every time I would try to start it, I would just end up getting lost in its monochrome caverns. So much of this game's exploration requires passing through blocks, which, without a map, made it a bit difficult to play, though I might just be spoiled by modern games. I don't know. I like getting lost in games, but I don't like smacking my face against every square inch of the game just to find where to go. I played the hell out of the remakes, and I loved those games, but I feel like I'd be doing the game and the franchise as a whole a disservice by not looking at the original Game Boy release. So I will only be covering the original Metroid 2 Return of Samus today and take a look at AM2R and maybe Samus Returns in the future, assuming I can get my hands on a 3DS capture card. If there is one thing I remember though, it's the music as soon as you start your adventure. The track of the surface of SR388 along with other unique tracks in this game were never officially remixed or covered until the remake 26 years later. So if you slept on this game for as long as I I did, it's kind of amazing hearing these seemingly unique tracks. The ones that aren't just gurgles and beeps anyway. So because of the many remakes of the game, both official and not, the premise of the game isn't very much of a surprise to me. Venture to the Metroid's homeworld of SR388, a name that I shit you not is named after an SR400 motorcycle, uncover the previously unseen stages of the Metroid's life cycle and exterminate the species and its queen from inside their own planet. It's kinda fucked up, but this is before we learned about the X-Parasites, so as far as we know, the Metroids are a threat to the balance of the universe and need to be eradicated. That infamous commercial for the return of Samus says that a Metroid survived the events of Metroid 1 and then mutated and multiplied, but that, that that's not true. If anything, that's the plot of the two games canonically after this game. Though in extension, I feel like Metroid 2 is the most deserving of the title Metroid. While sure, every game in the franchise revolves around the Metroids and how they're manipulated and used by either the Space Pirates or the Galactic Federation, Return of Samus has them in the forefront for the entire adventure, forming a personal attachment to Samus and the player. I don't know, it's just a thought that crossed my mind. It's kinda cool. I hear a lot of people say that they consider Metroid 2 to be the black sheep of the franchise because of its linearity, but unless they mean black sheep literally because of the monochrome color palette and the game being 95% pitch black, I don't think I agree with that and would argue that Metroid Fusion is more so the black sheep when it comes to the Metroid series, but we'll talk about that game in a future video, that'll be a bit. Metroid 2 The Return of Samus was once again developed by R&D1's Gunpei Yokoi, with the intent of bridging the gap between the Game Boy and the Nintendo Entertainment System in terms of quality, which sure wasn't exactly possible at the time, but I commend the effort, and I can't say that they didn't try. The sprite work and graphic design of this entry feel vastly superior to the first games, aside from the obvious monochrome screen, but I feel that this was a blessing in disguise, forcing the team to make entities and geometry stand out without using color. This is what led to Samus' various suits' iconic basketball shoulders, and some really creative enemy designs that all stand out with their own otherworldly designs. It worked out really well in the end, and everything from this point on has this game to thank for it. The issue though is the obvious lower resolution of the Game Boy screen at 160 by 144 pixels, as opposed to the NES's 256 by 240 pixels. Samus's sprite is already larger and more detailed than her sprite from the original game, so screen crunch would have already been a problem even if they recycled the sprites from the last game. And sadly, the game rarely does anything to accommodate for this. Sometimes I even felt like Samus's hitbox was larger than the size of her sprites, making the screen crunch feel even worse than it actually was, which can lead to a lot of frustrating moments like getting knocked back by an enemy off screen that you couldn't react to. Though I suppose this is better than the alternative of downrezzing everything to accommodate for the lower resolution like Mario Land did. Ugh, beggars can't be choosers. Now, on the surface, you might think that this is a pretty boring title screen, and it definitely is. You have nothing but these beeps and gurgles pretending to be ambience for well over 50 seconds, but if you're able to muscle through it for just long enough... That is fucking beautiful. But without further ado, let's... 
Oh, that's beautiful. And hey, look at that, we start with missiles and the Morph Ball! You don't really get anything for going left in the intro. After how big of a deal it was in the first game, I'm surprised that wasn't a staple of the series by the second entry. Oh, and you can crouch too, and aim down in the air! The game makes sure that you know this when you encounter these destructible blocks below you, and you might think, oh, I just need to bomb these. But you don't have bombs yet, so you goof around a bit until you realize you can aim down. Holy shit, I can look down! We even get the first appearance of Samus's ship, which is fucking awesome. The visor of the ship is transparent too, though I don't think that this is intentional. Black pixels are see-through. It was the same in the NES game. It's not long before you come across your first fork in the road, with the path to the right leading to a dead end filled with lava, and the left... The atmosphere of SR388 causes Metroids to rapidly metamorphosize into progressively larger and larger phases, sacrificing two of their nuclei for a thicker carapace, doing so even removing their weakness to the cold, though as a result they're even more susceptible to explosives. Interesting that the older you get the more vulnerable you are to being blown up. I guess I can relate to that. The first stage of the Metroid's life cycle, the Alpha stage, has a pattern that can be a bit tricky if you're still learning how the game works. And the game will beat you into shape until you get the hang of it, cause you're gonna be fighting a lot of these bastards in your adventure. So be sure to keep your health, or at the very least your missiles, capped and on standby whenever you can. Which thankfully you can do at these energy and missile recharge stations immediately after the first Alpha Metroid encounter. an earthquake. And with it, the pool of lava from earlier has drained, opening up the second area of SR-388's caverns. And from now on, that's the name of the game. Each main area of the game is blocked by a pool of lava, or acid. Literally pick your poison. And only by exterminating the metroids in the area will the lava pool lower, opening one of nine sectors of the planet's caves, with each providing stronger and more difficult stages of the metroid's life cycle. Just don't forget to save. Yeah, we got save points now. They don't provide as much fanfare as you'd later come to expect from the series, but it's a step in the right direction. And yes, I know that the NES disc version of the original game had saves, but this is, this is just way cooler. All right, goodbye music, and hello beeps and gurgles. That's, that's just what I wanted. Oh shit, are these like, Chozo ruins or something? I know SR388 was colonized by the Chozo before they were wiped out and fled because of the Metroids, but it's cool that even on this little screen that the ruins are recognizable to the player. We even got those traditional missile doors, still taking five missiles to open, but guarantee a Chozo statue inside presenting some new item to add to Samus's arsenal. Man, I'll, I'll never forget this room here filled back to back with missile expansions. It initially felt kinda lazy to me, like they couldn't find a better spot to hide all these, but in doing so, kinda made this room iconic, and I always feel happy whenever I see it now that I'm older. Though one of them is just out of reach, and if you're a veteran to the series, you might think, oh, I just need the high jump or the spring ball. I can't morph while jumping in the air, so I need one of those, right? But no, you need the all new spider ball upgrade. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Never mind, fuck me, I guess. The Spider Ball really gives Metroid 2 an identity of its own, though that's mainly because the Spider Ball as an item hasn't appeared in any other 2D Metroid game aside from the remakes. It was used frequently in the Prime games, sure, but it's such a vast departure from the original that it's hard to consider it the same power-up. However, it does become a bit redundant later on, likely why it was cut from future games, I'll discuss that in a little bit. Spider Ball is activated by pressing down on the D-pad once you're already in Morph Ball mode, and gives Samus a way to traverse vertically up walls or even over the ceiling, essentially any surface that isn't hazardous. It is a bit slow, and I was worried that it would become a bit of a pace breaker early on, but to my surprise, I thought it was fine. It can get a little annoying when you get smacked off of a ceiling by a weird bird mosquito hybrid, but I, I guess it makes sense. Wow, you get the ice beam pretty early in this game. Though I can't really say I'll be using it that much since only larval metroids are vulnerable to it, and I've already got the spider ball for traversing areas I can't jump to, but oh well, I guess I'll enjoy it while I've got it. I love the environmental storytelling with the husks of hatched metroids scattered between rooms, letting you know that an essential fight is about to come your way. And after a little bit of exploring with the spider ball... <laughs> the 
there's three more Metroids outside of the ruins once you get the Spider Ball. I don't really have a ton to say about them, but with their extermination, another earthquake sets in, and the next area is- Oh, hello! Uh, ah! I had a pretty rough time with the Alpha Metroids at the beginning of the game, but if you can get them right above your head without exploiting them, you can juggle them around with your missiles, which is always satisfying. Oh shit, the Chozo item is alive! Wait a second, is that Arachnus from Metroid Fusion? Holy shit, I can't even tell if I'm doing damage to the fucker! Well, no, I wasn't doing any damage. For some reason, Arachnus here is immune to all weaponry except for bombs, which doesn't exactly feel like it makes sense to me personally, but whatever, it works. It's an old game, and with enough of an understanding of the boss, he'll go down with little effort. Interestingly though, this is the only boss in the game that isn't a Metroid. Assuming you consider the Metroid encounters in the game boss fights, I don't know, I see them more as mini-bosses more than anything else, but you get my point. And with Arachnus's death comes the Spring Ball, a totally optional power-up, but one that I adore nonetheless, because it makes navigating through these Morph Ball mazes much easier on my patience. And once again, returning from the first game, right under the 8th Metroid encounter, you'll find the Wave Beam, covering a ton of real estate in its path and traveling through walls. I barely used the Wave Beam when I played through the first game, but that was mostly because of the game's jank feeling unavoidable for the majority of the game. So I felt I needed to tip the scales by freezing basically anything in my path just to survive. But here, I don't feel the need to make up for the game's jank and bullshit, so I guess as a compliment to the game and its engine, I had the wave beam for a majority of the game, even with the two additional beam types that I'll talk about in a bit. And yes, beams do not stack yet, we have one more game until we reach that point. Even the returning high jump has a bit of extra polish to it, making this neat echoing sound every time you use it in an enclosed space. It's a small detail, but it's a welcome one. You need to take on the ninth Metroid encounter underwater, and if you're like me, that means that you clenched at the thought of fighting a Metroid in a restricting underwater environment. But to my surprise, it didn't seem like water affected Samus' mobility in the slightest. In fact, I think the only time I struggled with water was near the end of the game. I'll talk about that when we get there. <laughs> tired of the Metroid encounter music yet? This theme plays for every Metroid encounter throughout the game, minus the Queen of course. I personally don't mind it, in fact I actually kinda like it and never really got tired of it. The music in this game is pretty solid, at least when it's not avant-garde ambient pieces. You know someone out there loves this stuff, it's not for me. Aw, oh, poor little Chozo statue. Did you misplace your ball? Aw, oh, dumbass, you left it in ball storage. Wait, are these behind every Chozo statue? Ah, the various suit, buried underneath all of these balls. It's kinda weird, you need to use bombs to dig through the fake balls, but the one containing the various suit doesn't open unless shot with a beam. It made me think that the game was busted for a second. I'd be more excited over the transformation if it wasn't slightly obscured by ball storage. It made it kind of amusing more than anything. Once again, the various suit halves all incoming damage and, in a unique trait to this game, increases Samus' movement speed by one third. Though, if I'm being honest, I never noticed this and only found out when researching the game before writing the script. Yes, you may sigh in relief, there are spikes preventing you from spider-balling up every surface in the game. Sadly, because god do I hate these bomb paths in the ceiling. You need to awkwardly scoot left and right dropping bombs to dig straight up, it just feels so janky and weird. Uh... Ah! Uh, you'll inevitably come across this sand that Samus can dig through by firing through it, and on the surface, that's pretty cool. You might even feel enticed to dig through every block in hopes of finding secrets. Don't do that. Very rarely is there any reason to not dig horizontally. I can only think of a couple of reasons that digging through the sand actually led to finding an upgrade. And more often than not- oh god damn it. Okay, I was not ready for this. I'm going to dig this way and- uh oh, Gamma Metroids, the meaner big brother of the Alphas. My first encounter with one was in these sand pits, which gave me a not so great first impression of them. They're actually not much harder than the Alphas, just fuck fighting them in the sand pits where they're able to move freely through the sand when you're not. Though because of their larger size, it's much easier for them to get stuck on terrain. Though they can sometimes reach through it with their new lightning attacks, something unique to this stage of the Metroid life cycle, at least in this game. Okay, was this music actually composed or did someone just fall asleep on their MIDI keyboard? Haha! <laughs> Not so tough when he can't fit through a two block hole, are ya? Oh, oh, you're just stupid. I'm not a big fan of this area, or at least how it's built. 
Two of the paths available to you loop back around to the beginning through one-way passages, meaning that if you missed anything on your way out, you need to find your way back to the original routes rather than just heading back the way you came. Now, one-way exits aren't inherently bad, but I will argue that they can be a pain in the ass if you don't know that they're one-way paths until it's too late, and you're punished by having to backtrack all the way back there. It just feels like level design that is deliberately punishing the player and padding out game time, which it probably was, but I'm not excusing it for that. Though making its debut in the Metroid series, you can find the space jump here in this collapsed structure after digging through some sand, and it's... I kinda hate it. I will never take the space jump in future games for granted again, because oh my god, this one is finicky as fuck. I still appreciate it for introducing one of the more iconic items in the series, but holy shit is it suffering from growing pains. I could not get the timing down for this, and sometimes Samus just uncurls for what feels like no reason. And I'm not pressing any direction on the d-pad with these, she just gets bored, I guess? Half the time I prefer to just spiderball up rooms if I'm able to, because it ends up being more reliable than the space jump, but then later you need to fight a Gamma Metroid in this long vertical room, using practically nothing but the space jump to ascend up there if you missed it. And god, combat with it just doesn't feel good. Jesus, I'm barely 90 minutes into this game and I already have 170 missiles? Holy shit. The Plasma Beam. Lacking the ability to penetrate enemies like in later games, but shares the ability to pass through walls with the Wave Beam. And it's easily the most powerful beam in the game, able to one-shot these drones or whatever the hell these machines are. I'm assuming this is a factory area? It's kinda hard to tell. I also learned how to exploit the Alpha and Gamma Metroids here. If you off-screen them, their iframes still reset, but don't become active until they're back on screen, so once you get the timing right, you can just bully them off-screen like you're ledge guarding in Smash Brothers. Fuck your rules, I'll make you a by my own. Oh, I love getting juggled by flies! Is this karma for off-screening the Metroids? Goddamn honeycomb or cobwebs making life difficult. Okay, there, the Alpha has been defeated. Oh, god damn it! Wow, only one Metroid in this area? That can't be right. Wait, why hasn't the lava lowered yet? Oh, I see. The lava here is for Area 6, and by killing that single Gamma Metroid, that lowers a lava pool inside Area 3, which leads to Area 5, and upon beating that- uh, Are those sentient tomato slices? <clears throat> and upon beating the literal two Metroids in Area 5, Area 6 then opens after backtracking through Area 4. I love numbers. <laughs> What the fuck are those? Okay, that's that's kind of cool actually, but someone must have been really proud of these because these never appear again. So this is when the game hits a weird point for me. We're about two thirds of the way through the game, but we already have a majority of Samus's upgrades, all of which that are used to open up new areas and paths once acquired. So from here on out, the remainder of the game is opened up to you after meeting your Metroid kill count, which gives the remainder of the game an almost mission-based feeling, which I'm not against, but feels kind of weird. Exploration is still there, but you get your last D-tank in this area. Or at least so I thought, where did my health go? Did they put an extra E-tank in this game that doesn't increase your energy meter? What the fuck was the point of that? Please tell me this is bugged. Oh god damn it, why did I have to meet you in the sand? Zeta Metroids, the first of the Metroids bipedal stages. Though that's not exactly reflected in the game given that they <laughs> they fly. They're tough fuckers too, orbiting around you until they stop to fire projectiles, and they can't be hit from below, so you need to align yourself horizontally to hit them with missiles, otherwise this fight could last fucking forever. This area is kinda neat. I like the little hub in the middle that provides you with each of the beams. I found the Spacer Beam here, also making its debut, but I decided to switch back to the Wave Beam. I wasn't aware that the Spacer could fire through walls in this game until I researched it after the fact while writing this script. Otherwise, I probably would have kept it instead of switching back to the wave beam, but oh well, not the biggest deal. Ah, there it is. I love everything leading up to the screw attack. Taking the time to maneuver around the room and loop back around to grab it from this Chozo statue, it builds a ton of suspense to what that item could be and pays off by giving you the most powerful item in the entire game. 
It sounds pretty cool, too. It's just a shame that I have to use the space jump to use it. Wow, look at all those spikes. I sure hope I don't have to backtrack through those. Oh, hello, suspiciously alone Alpha Metroid next to two Metroid husks. Hmm, I appear to be trapped. Well, allow me to run back around and- Oh my god! I can't off-screen him! They knew! They fucking knew! Omega Metroids. Bigger Zeta Metroids who fuck. They are weak in the back, drastically reducing the required missiles you need to take them out, and the screw attack even offers an extra layer of protection when they start doing that orbiting thing. But they still manage to give me a pretty hard time. I didn't get the hang of fighting them up until the final Omega Metroid encounter just before the final area. And yeah, Area 8 is a gauntlet of nothing but Omega Metroids. Even the wildlife appears to be diminishing, showing through the environment that the Metroids are at the top of the food chain here. I had a pretty rough time here with Omega Metroid number 36. I was dangerously low on health, and I couldn't for the life of me find an energy orb anywhere, and ended up having to backtrack to Area 6 just so that I can refill my health and stand a fighting chance. I understand that the final area is meant to be a gauntlet, and I did enjoy it, but fuck me for going in with low health, I guess. Thankfully, the final two weren't as tough, and I came out of the final 38th Metroid battle with most of my health, and with its death, the path to the Queen is final opened. Oh, now the water affects my jumps? Fuck you! God, Samus is about to vibrate into a parallel universe! Be sure to grab the ice beam at the top of this massive room before moving on. Looks like the statue got absolutely fucked, too. I wonder if the Queen knows about her baby's weaknesses to ice and tried to destroy it. I'm sure you know exactly what's coming after this. <gasps> the baby- oh god damn it, looks like Mama laid some eggs! Marvel Metroids, the greatest threat in the universe, and they're mean. Okay, I admit, in most games, I actually don't have too much of a problem with the Metroids. Larval Metroids, to be precise. But I think as a result of the screen crunch combined with Samus's unusually large hitbox, this is the hardest time I've ever had with a life-sucking jellyfish in the entire series. Oh, sounds like Mama ain't too happy about us killing her offspring. Okay, that's fair, who can blame her? I love the sort of laboratory look of this place, heavily implying that this lab is where the Chozo first created the Metroids. Oh right, the Chozo made the Metroids. I don't know if we covered that, I think I forgot- Oh, she's big! Much more of a threat than Mother Brain from the first game. The Metroid Queen actually puts up a fight. Much like her grown-up offspring, she's only weak to missiles, this time only in her head. And yes, that is an escape hatch you can use if you're about to die, but don't get too excited thinking that you can whittle her down a bit, leave, recharge, and come back to the fight. If you leave, her head health is fully restored. You gotta do this whole fight in a single sitting just like all the others. God, what a great final boss too. One of my favorite tracks in the game. It's so sinister, so dreadful. I was incredibly bummed out when this didn't return for the official remake. Plus one for the fan remake, I guess? If you manage to hit her with missiles while her mouth is open, you can even stun the queen for just enough time to morph ball into her gut and leave some bombs inside of her. And is even how I finished off the fight, closing it with the most satisfying way possible, with her head crumbling to the floor while the rest of her body disintegrates. And that's it. The Metroid threat is finally a rat- Mmm, Samus pulled the trigger, Samus, you don't know the terrors you're about to unleash into this world! I actually really like this ending, Samus showing her soft spot by sparing the Metroid hatchling, following her around like a baby bird thinking Samus is her mother, something vital to every game canonically after this, and honestly, I love the plot point going forward, just fuck Other M. I don't- <laughs> At least I think Other M is bad, I haven't played it for almost a decade. We'll get to that game eventually. But as it stands, the Metroid race is not eradicated but is in captivity. I had a surprisingly great time playing this game. Where revisiting and beating Metroid 1 left me with a lesser opinion of it than it was when I first played it, I actually enjoyed Metroid 2 a lot. And though I consider it one of the lower games on the Metroid tier list, it's responsible for a lot of what we take for granted in future games. And I can't believe that it took Nintendo nearly three decades to give this game the remake that it deserved. Because where Metroid 1 is simply poorly designed in most places, Metroid 2 feels incredibly well thought out. Its endgame could use a bit of work, sure, but it was for the most part only hindered by the hardware that it was designed for. Hopefully with the remakes this game can be remembered for what it truly was. A solid Metroid experience on a handheld console that really shouldn't have been able to handle the adventure that it was. 
And I think that's pretty fucking awesome.